Good morning, everyone. We're going to get this panel started. Good morning. My name is Mike Falkender. I'm the chief economist at AFPI. Uh, during the Trump administration, I had the privilege of serving as the assistant secretary for economic policy at the Department of Treasury. I was the chief economist to Secretary Mnuchin during the pandemic and worked on a lot of the pandemic bailout packages. Uh, and I'm also happy to chair this session on fighting climate extremism and keeping the lights on. There's been a lot of efforts recently by the Biden administration to curtail the energy production and remove the energy independence that we realized during the Trump administration. Fortunately, the Congress has done a great job fighting back. Not only did AFPI host the HR1 event that led to its passage later that week, but the debt ceiling bill that Congress passed yesterday included HR1 inside it. And so we want to not only talk about what are some of the things going on in the Biden administration in the energy sector, but what we can do to fight back on it. And so on my panel today, I'm privileged to have uh, Tim Dunn with us, who is not only a member of the AFP Advisory Board, he is also the, um, I've got the title, CEO of Crown Quest, Crown Quest uh, leading oil and gas company here in, the, in Texas. And then we've got Steve Moore, who has, uh, Larry Kudlow always reminds me of all of your different titles, but more, most importantly, Larry highlights the Govzilla book. Uh, but he leads some, uh, some of our outreach to coordinate across a number of, of groups to, to fight on a lot of these energy issues. And then finally, we have Ambassador Carla Sands, who is a, the co-chair of the Center for Energy and Environment at AFPI. So I thought we would get started by just talking about where things stand right now in the energy sector and some of the things we're seeing out of the Biden administration. So these are slides courtesy of, of Steve that we have supplemented a little bit. Uh, but you can see more than anything else what has happened to oil production. It obviously fell during the pandemic when we weren't consuming nearly as much, but we have not had a recovery in it. Um, and so we have had a significant, we're still more than a million barrels a day less in production than what we had uh, during, the, during the 2019 timeframe, even though consumption does, d demands are back up to where they were. And a lot of this is driven by the lack of federal lands being opened up to oil and gas exploration. Uh, that is a 0.13 number of uh, federal acres in terms of millions of acres leased out to oil and gas production during the, the first 19 months of the Biden administration. And this is not compared to the entire terms of other administrations. This is likewise compared to the first 19 months. Uh, and so the result is, is that we saw a decline in oil and gas uh, drilling on federal lands during the Obama administration. It then leveled off during the Trump administration. And now we're seeing the beginning of more decline during the Biden administration. And so it's with that I want to open it up to the colleagues I have on the panel. And so if we can get started with uh, Carla. The Biden administration has embraced radical climate orthodoxy, resulting in this war on American energy. One aspect is the regulatory assault on everything from gas stoves to the recent rule against gas-powered vehicles we saw introduced a couple of weeks ago. Can you talk a little bit about the breadth of the onslaught and what that means for American consumers? Yes, thank you for the question. So it's Biden's war on American energy is a gift to the Chinese Communist Party because almost everything that he's planning benefits China and hurts American consumers. I recently wrote an op-ed about how they're coming for our gas stoves, but it's not just gas stoves, it's all the gas appliances. They want them all electrified. And we know redundancy is a good thing. About 40% of the appliances Americans use are gas. They're not electric, and it doesn't stress the grid. You put everything on the grid, you know what's gonna happen. Texas actually has a, le a more fragile grid than California, believe it or not, because of all the renewables. And uh, we can see the, ga the gas-powered cars that probably most people in this room drive are combustion engine cars, are, they're accessible and affordable to working class and middle class people in America. EVs, electric vehicles, are expensive. This radical administration, their plan is to, in nine years, and it's really eight, because you have to have the model in the ninth year, in nine years, increase electric vehicle production by 900%. And it sounds impossible, but then you look at where are our federal, our dollars, our tax dollars going, 
the Biden administration is going to send tens of billions of dollars to the car companies so that they retool their production and they make electric vehicles. It's, it's a, like a Chinese Communist Party top-down uh, plan to control production of the, it's basically nationalizing the car industry uh, without saying it, because they, without complying, they're not gonna be in compliance, they won't be able to operate. So they're gonna try to force Americans into electric vehicles, and what that will do is decrease mobility to, for our working people, the ones who can't afford these cars. Uh, when you go to the car lot, just think in 10 years, it's gonna be 70% electric vehicles to comply. So we need, we need people to sue as soon as we know who has the standing to stop this overreach, uh, because I believe it's possible, it has to happen. Otherwise, we're gonna end up, I think the goal is, uh, to push working people out of their private cars. The American freedom where you can gas up your car and go anywhere you want in our country, anytime. Um, you look at the 15 minute cities that are happening now in Europe, in the UK, where they're geofencing people to 15 minutes from their home, and you have to get special permission to leave. This is happening right now. It's part of that overall, because we know climate isn't about climate at all. It's Marxism to control humanity, and I mean the working people, the great masses of the people. It's a, it's a new feudalism in the 21st century to control the activities uh, the living style and the, the, the you know, sort of the, the freedom of the people which Western nations are embracing. Yeah. Thank you, Scar thanks Carla. So Tim, instead of embracing pro-US energy policies to encourage American production, the Biden administration has been quick to place blame on American suppliers for things like price gouging or failing to invest in American capacity. So as somebody with an energy business perspective, can you talk to us about the energy regulatory environment change under the administration and what policy shifts have been most damaging for American energy independence? Well, sadly, I, I really don't think most of these uh, negative um, regulatory initiatives of the Biden administration have actually, um, I, I don't think you're actually seeing much effect from it yet. I think the main effect is to come, because in the oil business, we have enormous lag times. A decision you make today doesn't really show up for at least a year. And so the, um, like the federal lands, uh, most oil companies saw that possibility and front loaded their permits. And they had a, they had a, um, a trove of permits. Once those run out, which probably still has another year or two, and if there's no permits behind it, then you're going to actually see that drop start to happen. So, um, I mean, it's a real war. We, we see it. There, there's, uh, thankfully, a lot of limitations on what they can do. But they're trying to drive up capital, which, of course, means less drilling, higher prices, uh, which is good for the people already in the game. Okay? So they're actually enriching people like me. You must have voted for Biden. Uh, <laughs> You know, there are people that talk that way. <laughs> there are people that talk that way. It's fairly short-sighted, though, because he went, he went, he actually, the, the goal is to kill you. Of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, uh, the, the um, and there's a number of factors. The oil, um, oil profits have been really dismal the last 10 years. Almost everybody's lost money on oil stocks. That mostly has to do with uh, genius Wall Street thinking that you could put $20 billion into increasing production and the price wouldn't go down. Because, you know, they don't understand some basic economics <laughs> uh, in Wall Street. So uh, there's, I think there's a lot of factors going. But, but I just want to agree with the idea and maybe expand it a little bit. This, this policy, this energy policy, is really designed to, it, it, who knows who's designed it, but it certainly could be designed by all of our enemies to take America down so they can elevate. Certainly China, not only because uh, while we're doing all this silliness, they're building 500 coal-fired plants, um, not only so that they can catch up with us and pass us by pushing us down, but also it gives them a hegemony over the um, uh, renewable stuff because they, they are controlling the precious metals in Africa and, and other places that, that 
go into the, and manufacturing the solar panels and all that stuff. So they're putting us into a position where we're wholly dependent on them. But not just China. Russia is a major oil producer. This means higher prices for Russia because oil production. That, that, that thing there, that could happen in America, but it's not going to happen in the world. And the way oil prices work is uh, a 1% change in supply demand causes a 10% change in price. Or it's said another way, if you change, we've got about 100 million barrel a day market. If uh, supply increases 1 million barrels a day, price goes down $10. Supply goes down a million barrels a day, price goes up $10. So that projection right there is for an extra $100 of price increase, okay? Which plays into your scenario, great. Can't afford, can't afford a car, super. You can get on our bus. Can't, um, you know, we, we have all these electrical vehicles, which right now, none of the grid in the U.S. could get anywhere close to charging. I mean, we already we have what? What is it? Half a percent of the vehicles are are uh, electrical vehicles, and California's already had to tell people, "Hey, don't charge your car during the day." So, uh, it's it is a uh, it is a design to cause people to not be able to move and not be able to make choices on their own, and put um, all the power in the hand of central planners bring America down and our enemies up, just plain and simple. So Steve, turning to the economic implications of it, let me go through a few more slides that remind Wait, people. Hold, hold on this yeah. one. Cause, oh, go for I, it. Because um, this is the heart of the matter, by the way. Uh, by the way, how many of you think this is intentional? Raise your hand. <laughs> Almost everyone does. <laughs> um, so uh, the, you know, when I first met Trump in late 2015, I'll never forget our first meeting in uh, you know, Fifth Avenue and Trump Tower, and Larry and I spent about an hour and a half with Trump, and one of the first things I told him is I said, you know, Donald, we called him Donald back then, if you get it right, if you become president and you get it right, in four years, we could make America energy independent. And I'll never forget, you know, I've said this before, some of you remember, Trump shook his finger and he said, Steve, I don't want America to be energy independent, I want America to be energy dominant, dominant. <laughs> Look, we were. I mean, so th the green line shows that by, 2019, the end of 2019, before COVID hit, for the first time in any of our lifetimes, the United States was completely energy independent, something I didn't think would ever happen. Um, and we surpassed Russia and Saudi Arabia. So how many times did we talk about OPEC when Trump was president? Zero, and there was no OPEC. We, we basically uh, defanged OPEC by just, if the single biggest producer isn't part of your cartel, you can't have a cartel. Right, and so uh, really OPEC was non-existent. And that was the shale revolution, right, Tim? Yeah. I mean, it was an incredible thing. It was American ingenuity. It was people like Tim and others who went out and found these new technologies, including you know, fracking and horizontal drilling, amazing. Uh, and so we tripled our oil output and our gas output in eight or nine years, something I don't think even you probably thought was possible. No. But it, yeah. I mean, it was really an incredible achievement. I didn't achievement, think it was right? ever possible. And so there we are in, a, in a, you know, a commanding height, right, a commanding height in terms of where we are. By the way, we've learned right over the last 40, 50 years that whoever has control of the energy markets has an incredible geopolitical, nobody would care about the Middle East except for the fact that they had all this oil. So then Biden comes in and the green line, that's, I'm not making this up folks, that is Joe Biden's energy policy. That is his policy to take us from, you know, 12 million barrels a day to zero. I mean, that is true insanity. Only a religious zealot would think that there's anything wise about that. And so, I just, everywhere I go, I try to get people to focus on this. Now, I want to add one thing to what both of you guys were saying. You've been talking about the transportation system, and you're exactly right. Their goal is to get rid of cars. They, the left hates cars, right. by the way. They want everybody in freedom. transit. And, and by the way, they don't want, and what cars are is mobility. When you think about it, the car is probably, other than electric power and the car, those are two of the most liberating inventions in the history of the world. Right, and they want to get rid of both of them. So I want to focus just a minute, and then I'll turn it back to you. What people aren't paying attention to, because Tucker Carlson resigned, so it got <laughs> that overshadowed all the news. But um, on Monday, Donald Trump's EPA announced 
catastrophic new regulations at the EPA. Joe Biden's EPA made those announcements, not Donald Trump's. Oh, uh, did I say Trump? <laughs> yes. Biden. <laughs> Biden. Just to be clear. EPA. <laughs> A little Freudian slip there. Biden's EPA announced that they are going to put in new um, clean air regulations that are so stringent, intentionally so, that they will shut down every natural gas and coal power plant in the United States. Now, how big is that? How and manufacturing. And, well, of course, because yeah. manufacturing is related to that. Now, anybody want to take a guess? You can answer this because you know you're in the industry. What percentage of our power, our electric power, comes from coal, natural gas, and oil? 65%. 65%. You're kidding me. You're going to shut down half of the uh, plants in the United States? Where are we going to? That is not just a national security. That's a health and safety issue. Uh, now they say, oh, no, you can buy, you can buy uh, carbon offsets. That's what they say. The plants can buy. Uh, well, that's gonna, what's that going to do? It's going to raise the price. Who do you think is going to pay for that? <laughs> consumers are. You're talking about doubling and tripling. I have a friend, by the way, in Canada. You know, they have a lot of these dingbat ideas already in place. They pay electricity prices three to four times higher than we do in the United States. The, this is a clear and present danger. If you wanted to destroy the American economy, there's no better way to do it than to dismantle American energy. And I, I fear that it probably is intentional. And what's so tragic about this is that, you know, if Trump's policy, by the way, that one chart you were just showing, if because the price of oil has risen, and as you, as you were just saying, that the amount of your, that you produce as an industry is obviously totally related to the price, we, w we should be producing two to three million more barrels a day today if Trump policies were in place. OPEC just announced they're going to, uh, what, cut one million, one million a day? So that would have had no effect whatsoever on the price of oil. So if I sound frustrated, I am. <laughs> so thinking about some of the price impacts of it. Well, so part of the way that they have done this in order to encourage or mandate this move away from carbon-based fuels is through what they call the social cost of carbon dioxide. And this is, then goes into all cost-benefit analysis conducted uh, by the administration. And the Obama administration already greatly ex exaggerated the cost of carbon output to $51. We, of course, brought it back down during the Trump administration. And you can see that the Biden administration has, has nearly quadrupled it relative to where it was during the Obama administration. And this is how they justify many of these, these uh, rules that they're putting in place. Michael, can I ask a question of the audience? Absolutely. Anyone in this room know how much CO2 is in the air we breathe? 20. It's like She was right. 0.04%. It's a scam. And we need CO2. I mean, the pl it's plant food. And it's lower now than it's ever been in the history of the world. Please go right. on. Right. Well, and this is one of the things I've always struggled with, is that the, the rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration would have you believe that natural respiration is pollution, <laughs> right? Because all of us in respirating, the output of it is the carbon dioxide that they say is killing the planet. And they also want to get rid of cows. And I mean, kids, I'm not exaggerating. And they kids are killing themselves for, to save the planet. Children are committing suicide because they don't want to put out CO2. <laughs> That's how much they brainwashed and hurt our children. Yeah, and the impact has been devastating. If you look at what has happened to price increases, this is the inflation numbers that we have seen. And at the onset of the Biden administration, much of this was federal spending, but also the attack on American energy independence because energy price inflation has led the way when you go into the composite of, the, of CPI's consumer price index. It's the main gauge by which we measure price increases in the United States, the single biggest driver of the inflation that we have, have suffered from during the Biden administration has been the, the energy price increases. And so whether you look at aggregate economic inflation overall, whether you look at oil price inflation, whether you look at natural gas, so the, the upper line is what's going on in Europe, but even, the, even what's going on in the United States, we were down at a couple of bucks for natural gas and we're on our way to 10 bucks Per, per unit. So, and, and as this shift to renewables has taken place, 
the more that countries have their energy sources coming from renewables, the higher prices they're paying. And as Steve was alluding to before, who's leading the way here in the United States? It's California. And so if you look at energy prices from the three major energy providers in California relative to the rest of the country, this is where the Biden administration and the radical left environmentalists would like to take you. By the way, let me just, you're right. And in fact, the new standards that the EPA just announced, guess what state those standards came from? California. California. So they're trying to Californianize all of uh, these policies for the whole nation. That's right. So yeah. Steve and Carla, if you can in particular, though, speak to who, who is most hurt by these energy policies, and in particular, uh, the impact that it has on working class Americans and, and the poor in this country. No, this is a real, uh, me or? Either one, uh, uh, Carla, uh, and then we'll go to Steve, yeah. <laughs> it's dueling mics now. Um, so the, the poor, the working poor in the United States are most hurt, but we know that our American fossil fuels are harvested cleaner here than anywhere else in the world, and they're transported cleanly, and our cars run cleanly. In fact, combustion engine cars do less polluting, if you will, for 15 years compared to electric vehicles, which are, these dirty components are often made by child slave labor, the components, first of all, look at the Congo and the children, or the Uyghur people putting things together and making things in, in China. It's dirty, it, it takes tons of mining to make one EV battery, so it's clean, but then we have limitless um, energy in the ground in the United States. We are awash in energy, so it's clean. We have enough oil and gas to power the entire world. We are never going to run out. So the, the, the idea of what Biden and before him Obama were doing, it's perverse. It's anti-human. They want to de-industrialize <laughs> the West. You see Africa, India, Russia, they're not going along with this plan. And so it hurts the poor, but it hurts all of us. The, int the intention is less opportunity and freedom, but it's also to control our lives and it's to lower the living standards and bring everyone like Margaret Thatcher used to say, bring everyone down to poverty. That's the goal. So you're absolutely right. Um, look, look. Let's be. Let's put our big boy pants on and not pretend like we're lunatic, you know, left wingers. You cannot run a twenty-three trillion dollar industrial economy that produces steel, cars, the electric grid system, the cloud with windmills. I mean, really, of all the stupid ideas the left has. Even if you thought, ever agreed, and maybe some of you do. I mean, people have different opinions about climate change. I'm not going to get in, into that. But let's just assume for a minute that they're right and that we have 12 years left or whatever they say. What, in other words, let's say they were right, we can't use fossil fuels. They're not right, but let's say you couldn't. What would we do? We'd build 100 nuclear power plants, right? I mean, it's not complicated. You wouldn't, you wouldn't pave over the whole country with windmills and solar panels. You just put them, but they're against nuclear power plants. By the way, do you, know, do you all know what, there is one form of renewable energy that is highly efficient that we use a lot of. Does anybody know what that is? Hydropower. Hydro. Hydro. You know, we get a lot of energy from Niagara Falls. Hydropower is a great California way. is trying to ban it. You know that. I know. They're anti hydropower. <laughs> they don't even California. like hydropower because they hate dams. I mean, in other words, if it's an energy source that works, they're against it. If it's an energy source that doesn't work, they're for it. And one other quick point. So I was just having, I was mentioning, uh, I hate to do some name dropping, but I had dinner with Mike Pompeo a couple nights ago, who was I just a superstar. I love Mike Pompeo. And he was telling this amazing story that, you know, like the World Bank, because David Malpas runs the World Bank, and they, it was a dinner at his house. And so David and, and Mike were saying that none of these poor countries care about climate change. They don't, it is immoral that we go to these African countries that don't have electric power, and we tell them not to build coal plants, not to build natural gas plants. We bribe them. Windmills, you know, in these poor African villages. Really, this is an immorality that we're imposing on these countries. That chart that you were showing, electric power is highly associated with economic growth. The more electric power you use, the richer you are. 
And what they're saying is that these countries should use less of it. So I'm not buying into this BS that somehow we're going to save the world. And, and their new thing is environmental racism. Have you seen this? Yeah. Oh, you know, it's poor people who are being victimized by climate change. No, climate change is the playground of really, really rich people. That's, poor people don't get up in the morning and think about climate change. They think about whether they're going to have a job, whether they have a car, and these kinds of things. So we can't let them get away with that rhetoric. And if I could just say, so Africa, the continent, most of those countries' leaders are being bribed by the West, the UN, it's the rich countries. Yeah. We're telling them, don't use fossil fuels. Meanwhile, America has this clean technology. We can do knowledge transfer. We can sell our energy and allow them to have their industrial revolution. There are people in Africa, millions of people, living on about two fifty a day, $2.50 a day, cooking their food with dung when they could be using clean energy and allowed to thrive and have prosperity like the Western countries have had. We are holding them down for a false, I'll say false god. Yep. They deserve prosperity. And so if there's, globally, if we can put, if we can put a stop to what's happening, but it's gonna take so many patriots writing op-eds, suing, like uh, speaking out, going on social media, making protests, we cannot sit by and allow what's happening in our country and in the Western world and then in the world to happen. We have to stop it. The chair of our Energy and Environment Center here at AFPI is Rick Perry, and he and I were very much on Larry Kudlow for months, and then Larry Kudlow got on the Congress to make HR1 about the energy yeah. bill. Be and, and the reason that we prioritize energy is because there are two things that have taken more people out of poverty in the history of the world than anything else. They are capitalism and energy, and energy yeah. low cost access to reliable sources of energy. Now again, the myth on the left is that providing abundant energy is inherently problematic for the environment. And so, Tim, I want to come to you and talk a little bit about uh, the Biden administration, who's been shutting down American energy, has then been turning to places like Venezuela and Saudi Arabia to fill the gap. So can you talk to us about how environmentally responsible it is to shut down American energy production and move it to the countries we're outsourcing it to? Well, if you buy the, uh, the narrative that Flaring is bad. Flaring, by the way, is burning gas. Methane. Methane gas. Just like you do on your stove, which they hate. Just like you do in an electrical plant, which they hate. Mm -hmm. Because, um, so, the, we, we don't like to flare because we don't get any money for it, but sometimes it's necessary from upsets. But if you buy the, the thing that that's a disastrous, <coughs> uh, which is their narrative, uh, America, produces twice as much oil as Iraq and Iran and flares half as much. Wow. So we're four times more efficient. Right. Uh, now that's mostly because um, that's just an effect, it's more effective to sell gas than it is to flare it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, uh, by the it's, way, it's, Tim, when I was out in, um, in uh, North Dakota, Williston, uh, this was about four or five years ago, they were flaring the, a lot of the natural gas at night. They were just burning it off because they wanted the wet stuff, not the natural gas, because the price of the oil was so much higher. And and I asked them, why are you, couldn't you know, get why a, are you wasting this resource? Right? And you know what? What'd you say? Couldn't get a pipeline. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They didn't. Have, the reason that we're yeah. we're burning it off is because they didn't have the pipelines to get. And what was the first thing that Joe Biden did when he was president? Yeah. He killed pipelines. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but no, no, that's right. So. You know, it, uh, when you come at this from any direction, the facts don't support their stuff. But again, this is a Marxist, it is. It's, a, it's a Marcus Marxist plan with great framing. I mean, look, their framing's great. You want to save the world or you want it to, you want it to blow up? Well, I want to save the world. Okay, well then you have to accept all our environmental things. So we have to engage in that framing thing, which I think you're hearing it. Do you want poverty? You want government mandated poverty? Or do you want to lift people out of poverty? And that's what we need to be talking about, not facts and statistics. Yeah, good point. So then I won't go to more facts. And <laughs> um, but, I, but I did want to show you a little bit about the enormous improvement that we have made in air quality in the United States over the last 30 years. So the, the notion that the energy independence that we generated, the fracking boom, that it brought down costs of energy and realized the, the economic production we did during the Trump administration was done at some massive environmental damage, 
that's betrayed by any measure of of environmental output that you would that we measure at the EPA. These are not my numbers, these are EPA numbers. And if you look instead at where the, the emissions are coming from, mind you, we have a larger economic output than China does. We are still the, the top economic producer in the world, and yet their, their carbon emissions are two and a half times ours for less economic output. India is not, you know, India is at 7%, uh, and yet the Paris Climate Accord advocates would have you exempt China and India from requiring that they do anything about their carbon emissions. China basically says, yeah, we'll think about it maybe in the 2030s. Let me just interject something there if I can. The car, you know, carbon emissions means carbon dioxide. As you mentioned before, carbon dioxide causes the, plant, the earth to green. It's not a pollution. It's, actu it's, it's actually pollution. green. Yeah. Green gas is carbon dioxide. The thing in greenhouses. <laughs> greenhouses. If you want, if you want your plants to grow twice as fast, you pump CO2 into your greenhouses. So uh, it's that's that's totally bogus as as complete. But there is a particular um, thing that actually does hurt people. It's particulate matter, yes. soot, things like that, like burning dung or cooking over a right. over a a, 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 a fire instead of electricity. Right. That actually shortens lifespan by 10 years. Yeah. Well, we're the only industrial country that has our particulate matter below world health standards for, for safety. Yeah. We're the only big industrial company that does that. We've got one place that we have a problem, and it's on the West Coast, from particulate matter blowing over from China. So by the way, if you go back, go back to that previous chart, the previous one after before that. So, these are gigantic reductions mm -hmm. in pollution levels. And, you know, I do a lot of talking to high school and college kids, even at some of the top universities. In, in the, and when I ask, the, you know, kids between the ages of 16 and 22, do you think the air that we breathe today is cleaner or dirtier than it was 50 or 75 or 100 years ago? 80 to 90 percent of them think that the air was cleaner back 50 to 100 years ago than it is today. And they think the water was cleaner than it was 50, 100 years ago, uh, which is completely wrong. I mean, these we've reduced, I mean, think of Houston. Think of, uh, you know, no cities like Los Angeles, Pittsburgh, they, you know, Gray Hayes. Remember Los Angeles 50 years ago? Of That's course. gone. Those are real pollutions. As you said, particulates, lead, sulfur, um, carbon monoxide. Those are pollutions. Mm -hmm. Those are pollutions. If you have asthma, you have a big problem. The, the EPA, the, uh, what's her name? Who's the uh, woman who's the, uh, uh, who runs the, who runs the EPA for um, Biden now? Um, anyway, she was giving a press conference and said, we're not going to let these Republicans force Americans to breathe this dirty air. What are they talking about? You don't get sick from carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is not a pollution. So tell your it's kids not. that. Tell your kids and grandkids. Yeah. And so. then I just wanted to mention something else about particulate matter. The radical Biden administration is about to attempt to regulate normal particulate matter to shut down. It'll shut down almost all manufacturing in the United States because companies will not be able to comply. Yes. What, what particulates are they attacking now? Well, they just, the, what they do is they just keep lowering the standard. Yeah. 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 So there's no way, that's what I was saying, there's no way you could have a coal burning plant they could possibly comply with those standards. So they're they're just turning the screws and, and just, you know, eliminating. Moving the, the goalpost. Yep, 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 yep. Can you do so, this to the point? Good, you know what? We the don't do enough. Probably, the, there was a tragic, tragic um, Supreme Court decision, what was it, 15 years ago or so, that as soon as they made no, the decision, one which was basically the endangerment finding, which was a completely wrong, I forget whether that the was a CO2 is an yes, endangerment, yeah. yeah. and it was a completely C wrong that, that it's decision. a pollutant. And this is what the Biden administration is hanging its coat on and all these regulations. But we have West Virginia versus EPA, yeah. so there, and there's Same. more legislation, in, it, it, more litigation in the pipeline. There's another one coming up soon. So we need to absolutely keep pushing hard. The left sues about everything that's productive, and our tax dollars are funding it. In fact, there's like $27 billion in Biden's, uh, in Biden's financing to fund those groups that sue, t sue good legislation and, 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 and uh, real progress. And so that's part of what uh, the new budget that 
the great Speaker McCarthy. God bless him. We should give him a hand. He's done an unbelievable job. It's in that bill to scrape that back. $27 billion of, of like litigation funding and mischief funding. What is West Virginia? Go ahead and explain what West Virginia. Uh, Please go ahead. I don't know. Well, the West Virginia versus EPA case was to say that if, if a regulatory agency is going to come in and create a massive rule, they have to point to explicit authorization in statute. You know, so if there's a phrase in the decision somewhere that says something like, um, Congress doesn't hide mandates in statutes. They, they, they enact them with big, bold letters and, and are very explicit in their decisions. Mm -hmm. And so what the Biden administration does is they have teams of lawyers that are scraping through decades of laws on the books asking how can we bend current statute in order to apply it to this policy or or you know religious objective that we have which is which is more I think what you know it's it's the climate extreme I categorize it as a as a religion these days as opposed to a, a, a political or economic philosophy and in search of executive authority to go after it, they bend existing statutes to claim that their regulatory agencies have authority. And the Supreme Court in the West Virginia EPA case said, no, if Congress wanted the regulatory agency to do that, they would have been oh. explicit. So then the state suing may be our real um, uh, dike here. Yes, and so the state suing, but where one of the issues that we have there is that a, a number of the liberal states band together, and then when they get judgment, they create pools of money that then fund more lawsuits. And it's lawfare now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, look, there is there is good news on this. You yes. know, we've been filling you with bad news. I don't <laughs> love to but I'm, yeah, you I'm know, wanting to move we, to the good news. <laughs> I've been looking. You know, we've been looking really closely at what do Americans really think about climate change, and here here's the basic, you know, very short summary. If you ask most Americans you're concerned about climate change, 80 to 90 percent will say yes. I'm concerned about climate change. Why wouldn't they? That's been all they've been learned since you know the kindergarten that climate change is a big deal. So we're not going to get anywhere by telling people there's not climate change, right? But two things are in our favor. One is most people are right. They they get it that none of this stuff that Joe Biden is doing is going to change the temperature of the planet, right? And as, a, as one of my good friends says, if they're right about climate change, we're screwed because nothing they're doing is going to have any Im impact whatsoever. The second thing that really is important is if you ask the average person, are you concerned about climate change? Yes. How much are you willing to pay to combat climate change? Oh, maybe $75 to $100 a year. They're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. They're talking about taking away your car. They're talking about taking away your air conditioner. They're taking, a, you know, Americans have a love affair with their cars. Do you think people are gonna, you know, okay, yeah, I'll go out and buy an electric vehicle when only 6% of the p people are buying those? So I think we have to basically really tell people what the agenda is here and how destructive it will be to their lives, yeah. Well, sadly, Congress uh, gave them the power. Yeah, that's right. And one of the biggest threats we have to our republic is our, we, we've lost representative government. We, we, all these laws are being made by people that weren't elected. Uh, they're not accountable to anybody. They have civil service things, so you can't fire them. They have uh, sovereign immunity, so they can create crimes deliberately, and there's nothing you can do about it and they don't feel the effects of any of the rules they make, okay? So that's, but Congress can take all that back. It's just a matter of will. They can just take it back. And that, I think that's probably the number one thing we have to do as citizens. 100%. Is insist that our representatives take the power back and represent us. There are three branches of government, not four branches of government. And right. so one of the important pieces of the debt ceiling bill that Congress passed yesterday, there's an element in there called the RAINS Act. And what the RAINS Act says, I believe the <laughs> threshold is $100 million. If, it, if a regulation has more than $100 million of impact on the economy, Congress must affirmatively approve it. Right now under statute, Congress can exercise the Congressional Review Act and they can reject a rule, but it requires the signature of the president. So you need half the House, half the Senate, and the signature of the president. 
We got that on the ESG rule, and we got it on one of the other items. But then Biden, ve Biden has vetoed two things during his administration. One was the ESG rule, and another one was uh, another. What? I think like oh, whether to open up the account. What didn't he veto the sure. bill on the COVID? Whether the COVID emergency. Was it may have been that. Yeah. So. This would say, no, 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 it's, it's not that you need both houses of Congress and the president to repeal the rule. Right. You need both houses of Congress to so affirm yeah. the rule. And so that's an important element if we can get that enacted as part of the debt ceiling, which is one of the elements. That's so and that's necessary. a very hopeful thing. The, the House has not been all that functional, in, in my view, until now. Uh, the House is now being run like a coalition government. And historically, you've had like three different families kind of fighting for, you know, lobby money or something. I don't know what it is. They're actually getting stuff done now. I think AFPI is a part yeah. of that for, for sure. The mood of the country is part of that. Um, and so now they're starting to pass things. This next election cycle is a big, 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 big deal. <laughs> If we can keep a functional house that will actually pass stuff, like the Brains Act, like a 20-year-old idea, they finally got it done. Uh, we've got a great Senate map coming up. And if we can get control of the Senate, they've now figured out how to put all this stuff in reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So we're now, we're now we can get most of this stuff done with a majority. If we can get a trifecta uh, and AFPI does its job with your help, we can actually go in with a plan enact the plan, and then actually turn this ship. Save America. I think that's actually, that's actually very feasible at this point in time. Yes. Isn't it also encouraging that the Supreme Court is chipping away at the authority, the fake authority of the administrative state? Yeah. And will that not have awesome implications for this overreach that is in our energy Yes, I think that's a great point. Uh, the whole Chevron deference thing of you, you just have to always defer to the administrative agencies, I think is going to fall. And uh, the state suing and winning is a really good signal. So legally, we're going the right way. But <laughs> if we don't win this next election, sure. they can pack the court, and all that goes the other direction. There's a fight brewing in California, and you can be part of it. <laughs> you already are. Um, it occurred to me here that Congress could change the law regarding getting bureaucrats fired. So would that require the president signing, or can Congress alone make that change, or does it require a presidential signature? Revising civil service law will require a signature of the president. By the way, uh, by a tr one of Trump's greatest things he tried to do, his single greatest act was getting America out of the um, Paris Climate Accord, President. That was fantastic. But um, he tried to um, he tried to take on the civil service Six system. 11. And of all the things that he did, oh my God, the left just completely went crazy. By the way, ninety percent of federal workers are Democrats. You know that, right? Ninety percent. And they went up. And here's the line that the Washington Post and New York Times said: How dare Donald Trump do this? He's trying to politicize the civil service system. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most politicized system. The, look, folks, the deep state is not a figment of our imagination. I've always said what you guys did under Trump was doubly amazing because everyone in the deep state in these administrative agencies was against what Trump was trying to do. Wouldn't you say? I mean, Can I get absolutely. Secretary Bernhardt to talk oh. about Schedule F real quick? <laughs> <laughs> he had the guy that was making it happen. Jim, sure. So, um, this, my name is David Bernhardt, and I was auditing this class. And uh, it, it's awesome, by the way. I was just thrilled sitting back here. So we'll talk about a little bit this uh, a little bit this afternoon. But the reality is, there's a lot there's a lot a president can do to change the behavior of the bureaucracy a lot. And one of the things uh, President Trump did was lay out an EO, but it was very late. It was I think uh, October and November of 2020. Uh, and, uh, but there's a lot a president can do with will to change the bureaucracy, but it requires, and here's where the wheels generally fall off, it requires the agency administer, administrators 
to have the will, the competence, and the courage to take action. And um, so that might be a little um, headline for the discussion today at lunch. Nice commercial. Thank you. And <laughs> I, I just wanted to say about the Paris Climate Accord, it was never, it, I know it's called the Paris Climate Accord, it's a club. It's a club of rich European nations and English-speaking nations, and it's just about a giant transfer of your money to other countries, including China. Has nothing to do with the climate. It's simply wealth transfer. So it's a scam. Speaking of giant pools of your money being used as a scam, I want to switch to ESG. Um, so this is, so I, I've been a finance professor for more than 20 years, and this is, in my view, one of the biggest threats to finance, which is the, its weaponization. Because what it's about is taking your money, retirement money that you have set aside, that's set aside on your behalf in state pension plans, and not allocating it based upon what will get the highest rate of return and therefore provide the best retirement outcomes for our hardworking American citizens who are saving for retirement, but instead to meet political objectives that cannot be done through our legislative process. So let's entirely bypass the legislative process, move decision making about labor laws, about climate, about diversity, and move it to wealthy fund managers who predominantly donate to the Democratic Party. And as I've reminded people regularly, both the head of the National Economic Council at the beginning of the Biden administration, as well as the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, are BlackRock alums, and BlackRock, of course, is the biggest ESG fund out there. So, Tim, you alluded to this a little bit earlier. Can you speak to the impact, not just of the regulatory environment, but what's going on with the weaponization of finance and how that's impacting investments in the oil and gas sector? Well, our, our lead bank uh, is one of the big, can't, too big to fail banks, and they popped up and said, we're gonna honor the Paris Accords, and we're like, Which bank was that? JP Morgan. <laughs> And we called them, and so we got on with some of their people, and they said, well, look, here's the deal. Well, was this recent? Uh, it was probably two years ago, something like that, maybe three, I don't know. Um, and they said, well, here's the deal. We came within this much of losing a shareholder initiative that would have been far worse than this. So basically, our shareholders are demanding that we do this. So we don't really have any choice, okay? Now, where did that come from? It came from BlackRock and these funds, it, and it's not their money, but they're voting on behalf of a bunch of people that they're gonna hurt. They're being paid to help those people and they're hurting those people. That's just the bottom line. So we've got a really broken structural system there where it's, it's really the same thing as Congress. Congress has given their proxy to a bunch of bureaucrats to make laws and crimes, by the way. They can make crimes. Can you believe that? We have bureaucrats who can make crimes. I mean, that's, to me, that's something we got to do. It's like bureaucrats can't make crimes, period. And incidentally, um, this is a clear-cut violation of the fiduciary yeah. duty of these banks and these, these companies. Now, I have no problem, Tim, if, let's say, you take your money and you want to put it in the ESG fund, it's your money, you can do what you want with it. You know, so there, sure. as you know, there are ESG funds out yeah. there. You want to save the planet and, you know, invest in all this climate change you want to stuff? lose your money? Go, Go ahead. ahead. Be my guest. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. These are massive fund managers like BlackRock and others that are basically taking people's pension fund money and playing politics with it. And they're and, investing in China. And investing in China. And so. benefiting even their military. Now, here's the good news. Um, I mean, it's bad news if you invest in an ESG fund. But those ESG cop investments, <laughs> so there's a massive amount of money that came into ESG funds yeah. and very few investments. Therefore, all the funds had to compete for those investments. And so you had things like Tesla's evaluation was <laughs> about <laughs> three times greater than it would have been had they profitably made every car in the world. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, why? Because I've got all this money, I've got to buy something, yeah. buy a Tesla. It goes up, it goes up, it goes up, it goes up. Well, at some point, Good point. okay, at some point, and I think it's beginning to happen, because I'm hearing guys like, ah, oh, we the invested shortens. in all this stuff and it's not worth anything. 
That's, that worm is starting to turn. And by the way, do you know what every one of the ESG funds di divested in last year? Oil companies. Do you know what the highest performing stocks were in 2022? Oil companies. So they sold what they should have bought, and they bought what they should have sold. And then the other industry that they were largely not investing in was defense sector. Right. Until all of a sudden they decided that <laughs> democracies defending themselves and helping their neighbors like Ukraine actually is beneficial to society. That you know, democracies being able to defend themselves facilitates human rights as opposed to degrading it. And when you talk about arms companies, most of our critical minerals, the rare earth minerals, come from China and they're processed in China, even if they're from us, they go to China to be processed. Part of HR1 that the great Speaker McCarthy just passed with his great house is, it's one of the five pillars in HR1 is that we're gonna onshore critical mineral production and processing. It's essential, it's in every one of your cell phones, it's in the electric car batteries, but it's also, we have to have it for our defense equipment. It's in all those missiles. So I lead the ESG effort here at AFPI, but in addition to that, we worked very closely with Congress on passing HR1, and as Carla mentioned, one of the key elements is critical minerals. But for those of you who did not see it, we actually hosted uh, Majority Leader Scalise and the three chairs that had jurisdiction over the various elements of HR1 at the AFPI location in Washington, D.C. the week that they passed the bill, and then I was invited by Speaker uh, Leader Scalise to actually be in the gallery when they passed HR1. We have been involved from day one in getting this pushed. When it came time for Speaker McCarthy to announce that HR1 was going to be the energy bill, he went on to Larry Kudlow's show to announce it because AFPI has been leading the charge on, on getting this done. It's got these five important elements, and so Carly started talking about it, but Steve, do you want to talk a little bit more about why HR1's enactment is so critical to reversing? Well, I'll just going to say damage. just one quick thing. I think it was, first of all, you know, I've had run-ins with Kevin McCarthy over my life. I mean, he and I have had a love-hate relationship. I think he's been an outstanding speaker so far. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, what he's done has been amazing. And, and by the way, I have to say that, that um, revolt that you had at the beginning of the year, hats off to those guys, right? Yes. I mean, they have made, in my opinion, they've really made um, Kevin McCarthy a stronger speaker. He, he uh, has empowered the members. Yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. So, and by the way, these guys, it really shows what you can do. There were only like eight or nine or 10 or 12 of these people, including Chip Roy here from here in Texas. And they took on, every, even the Wall Street Journal editorial page was against them. Mark yeah. Levin was against them. Uh, my friend Sean Hannity was against them. Everybody was against them and they hold, held firm and they had a big victory. They changed some of the rules in a productive way and Kevin McCarthy has been a better speaker as a result. Now. What they did with HR1, I, I mean, and I was, I meant the, uh, the uh, wait, the bill that they passed Then we got the yesterday. Yesterday. bill, versus yeah, this, this one. one. This bill is a lot of the things that AFPI has been working for, yeah. so we, you know, we can't live, obviously, with 87,000 new IRS agents. If the Republicans allow that, I'm going to, you know, tear up my RNC card. I, <laughs> we cannot allow them to have 87,000 new IRS. But, you know, it's a great bill, and hats off, I don't know how, McCarthy did it. It's tough to get 218 votes, yeah. and he pulled this, it off. This is generational change. Yeah. This, this does things like stops New York from not allowing Pennsylvania energy to flow by pipe to New England. New England was heating their homes with Russian energy when they invaded Ukraine. Yeah. Because of that crazy law, it allows us to build refineries. It, in fact, changes the permitting for all industry, not just energy, so that those projects that are important for our country can get built. In the average project in the United States today takes four and a half years to get permitting and get through everything. And they may not get the up or down because people are suing. It may drag on for years. The average road, seven years, although in California, it takes longer uh, than seven years to build a road. You know what's ironic, by the way? They can't even build their green energy projects because they've been like hoisted <laughs> in their own petard. I mean, it's hilarious. They can't do any of this stuff done because they built all these obstacles. But here, I want to make a critical point. We got this victory yesterday. Republicans in the House should go home, don't come back, and basically, so Joe Biden, the ball is in your court. We passed a debt ceiling increase. If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna negotiate and the, we go past you know, D-Day, it's on you, right? It's on you. Beautiful. And, on, and n if he's not gonna negotiate, at, we've, I've been in this town for 36 years in the swamp. 
every major budget deal we've gotten that's cut spending has been done on the debt ceiling. That's right. On the debt ceiling. So I feel very strongly that we cannot blink on this. This is a rock of Gibraltar. No, Joe Biden, if you're not going to negotiate it, then you're going to cause Armageddon, and it's on you. And those IRS agents are out, are, they are <laughs> defunded in his go. debt ceiling deal. They're out. Yes. They are. Yeah, in that bill. Yeah. We all like this to pass. We need the Senate to pass it and the President to sign it. It's not going to happen. It's not going to no. happen. They're going to no. chip away and do them onesies, twosies. They we already committed. We have to win. Do you think we'll get to the point where the, we have to shut down government? Maybe. I wouldn't. Look, we're not going to default on the debt, but we may have to. Would it be a tragedy if we shut down the Department of Education, the Department of Energy for a month? Do you think anybody? <laughs> by the way, do you all know that? I mean, this is a serious thing. Did you know for the last three years, federal workers haven't been working? Did you know that? Most Americans have no idea. They Did don't you know go that? in. It's a breeze to I'm, drive I'm downtown these days. They're not, they haven't gone in the office, 70% of them, for three years. No. Nobody even knew they were missing. So maybe we could live without these. But I'll tell you this. We, we can't blink on this because we will have a financial catastrophe if we allow this debt to go to $50 trillion. And that's what Biden's basically saying. He's basically saying, give me an unlimited credit card. And we have to say hell no to that, don't you think? I mean, we just have to say hell no. We're not going to give you an unlimited credit card because this is, it's, the financial disaster is not that we might not pass the debt ceiling on time. The financial disaster would be if we just keep increasing the debt. Are there senators on the other side that feel that way? Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin came out and Although said, in the end. if you're from West Virginia, call Joe Manchin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is a bill that is subject to filibuster. So they're going to need 60, but that means Chuck Schumer needs you know, yeah. nine Republicans as well. So we can Why hold firm. Why does it have to have 60? It's a, isn't this a spending bill? Um, it, I, don't, I think he needs 51. I'm not sure, but I don't even They've think They've been loath to run, reconcil to, to run sure. it through reconciliation for some reason. I don't know. But okay. if the House. So it so, takes 60. Right? right. Now, the thing is with Dianne Feinstein not coming into work and. Who knows about John Fetterman? And John Fetterman. <laughs> And then Joe Manchin saying, no, it's completely appropriate for us to have spending reductions as part of this. Right yeah, now, we we've got a majority in the Senate, a working majority on this issue yeah. that there should be. And so the expectation is, is that we'll get a half or a third yeah. of what's in here. Right, right. But recognize that had this bill failed, and it only passed right. 217 to 215, right? One vote. right? Wow. If this had failed, we would have had a clean debt ceiling That's because right. once you rely right. on a single Democrat vote, you're looking at a clean debt ceiling. 100% correct. And so the, for those of you out there that are now upset that there are hardcore conservatives that voted for a debt ceiling increase, we are not defaulting. Yeah. We are not balancing the budget next month. Yeah. The debt ceiling had to be increased. Yes. The only question in front of members That's right. is do we have a path to get spending reductions or not? So you have to give them a pass. You have to support them on a debt ceiling increase right. as long as it has us on a path to spending reductions. Because as Steve said, if 70% of the bureaucrats can still be working at home, then those folks can live with a 1% increase in their budget per year for the next 10 years. And that's the deal, 1% increase deal. per year. But yeah. the other side's going to, let's say that you default, it gets to the default on the debt. There will be no default. No. There will be no default. Because you'd, you'd shut down agencies, but you'd still be able to pay the. Um, there's money. There's 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 yeah. buckets of money to keep things going. Don't worry. Most agencies actually. I don't know if DOI is that way, David, but uh, most agencies actually have so much in fees and stuff they don't even they don't even have to shut down. So, go ahead, David. Yeah, so the way that the debt ceiling... But, but, if, no. but if, if, I could, if I could just... But, yes, but that unspent COVID money that's sloshing around in all these agencies, Kevin McCarthy's bill takes it back. Yes. It goes back to you and to pay down our debt. Thank God. And the most, actually, other than defunding, you're not giving the money for the IRS, there's all, I, most people don't, aren't aware of this, but in the Inflation Acceleration Act that we passed <laughs> last year, there is 300 billion, not 300 million, 
$300 billion green energy slush fund. Did you know that? $300 billion. By the way, does anybody know who's running that program? John Podesta. John P He's just a political hack. We cannot... Solyndra, like 10.0. Exactly. And $300 billion is like, and by the way, every penny of that's going to go to the Sierra Club, all these left wing groups. It's all going to go right that's into like, the next election. That's like 5,000 right. AFPIs or heritage foundations. How can we win if we're going to give them $300 billion? So we, that's. Well, let me ask you another out. trivia question. Yeah. How many bankers are there at the Department of Education? <laughs> oh my God. Probably a lot, right? No, the answer is none even though they run, I think, the sixth or seventh largest bank right. in the nation. It's called the Student Loan Portfolio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And yet they have no bankers. So two comments. Number one, this bill rescinds the student loan forgiveness Yay. on not only the amount that he wants to outright forgive, but also restricts them from changing income-based repayment so that people only pay a very small fraction and then have a bunch of it forgiven. Number two, the Inflation Acceleration Act also creates a new bank in the federal government at the EPA. Oh, Jesus. So to the extent that you think that the Education Department has done a good job running student loans, you can only imagine how well the EPA will run a bank investing in And cylindras. police. Gives them police as well. There's a whole new infrastructure they're trying to bring in to police with EPA. It's unbelievable. But Betsy DeVos, President Trump's Education Secretary told me personally, we need to defund and take away, do away with the Education Department. Yay. <laughs> so I wanted to open it up. I'll start, Tim, with you, but then also open it up to the audience. A lot of you have more experience running oil and gas operations than we do. Uh, what's missing from our list? What can we at AFPI through the Center for Energy and the Environment, what are some of the other pain points that are out there that we can highlight and bring attention to, not just to Congress, but also so that we've got that first day set of executive orders in the energy and environment space in order to once again put us back on a path to energy independence? Tim, I'll open it up to you and then I'll, I'll open it up to the others. Well, I hope we have a EO, every EO we can to curb all this silliness about um, CO2 emissions. It would be ideal if we could, if we could get rid of this uh, CO2 as a polluted business. Um, and so that, that's one thing I would love to see on day one. Um, also, um, you know, one of, our, one of our ways to really help the whole world, it, it, won't, it, it actually won't help us as much because right now we're, we have a much lower gas price than the rest of the world by a factor of like 10, natural gas. But to have an export, if we can start exporting to the rest of the world, we can, we can help maybe help Europe keep from melting down, what ulti ultimately is a bad thing for us if, if uh, Europe melts down. So uh, that permitting, permitting stuff, speeding that sort of thing up. But actually, I think one of the biggest things for oil and gas is actually that when they uh, pass through tax, um, the rates, Go, go way up, like, mm -hmm. so uh, corporate ra tax rates went down to 21%, and uh, if you own a partnership, a business that's a partnership or an LLC, there's a, and that's permanent, the 21% is permanent. If you own an LLC, there's some sort of a, I don't know how it works, maybe you do, Steve, there's some sort of a reduction in, that makes it equivalent to a C-Corp right. for a Yeah, there's a, a small partnership. business pass-through of a 20% right. deduction. Yeah, 20% yeah. yeah. deduction, okay, so, if you're a partnership, which most, most small businesses are, are, are partnerships, well, that expires in 25. So that's us. That's the Republican Party. Those are small it's, businesses. It's, uh, yeah. it's private businesses, yeah. I would say. They're not, of a, yeah. not necessarily private. small, yeah. but private. And so um, that ex extending that and extending that tax cut uh, is probably <laughs> one of the biggest things you can do for the oil business because... If you don't, that's going to swamp the economy and, and reduce demand, which is bad for everybody and especially bad for the energy business. Yeah, this is one of the things that's always striking about the way that the Democrats go about their business. They, they claim that they're for the little guy and for small businesses, and yet everything they do provides benefits to the super large businesses. And so whether that's and the, the expiration unions. Of, and the unions. And so whether that's the expiration of small business tax credits or it's any kind of regulation that a large entity is always going to have an advantage at implementing relative to anybody that's small. Sir, please. I want to emphasize again the administrative problem because I'm tired of getting stuff at the uh, chair of the uh, energy committee that's on my file. Could you just jot some of these just the nice on the court, got a decision from a federal court to 
the BLM still refuses to give him a permit to drill on federal property. So, you know, I'll return to that if you would just, and then I'm happy to do anything with this whole thing. Mm -hmm. There are thousands yeah. of companies just like your client. They're not letting the permits go through. They say they are, but they're slow rolling. It's denial by delay. And so I think that we should take a case up and, and, uh, and get a decision and stop them because this is bureaucratic mischief. He did go to court. He did get a decision. Yeah. A higher court. Well, I mean, Dave, David can talk about this also. Come to David's panel. Because um, he can tell you about his new book. My favorite story is that he's uh, talking to a lady that says she speaks for the mice who works for a Department of Interior. I, I, and uh, I don't do the story justice, but you've got a bunch of people who don't, don't care about the law. They don't care about, and their sovereign immunity. So they can do whatever they want to. And that's got to change. That's a fundamental structural problem we have. You know, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm really proud of being part of AFPI is because I, as an economist, normally come at it kind of just more narrowly at, well, here's what we need to do from an economic standpoint. But so many of these issues have overlapping problems that if we don't have a comprehensive approach, it's not just dealing with what's the right economic policy, but it's how do we actually have a, a civil service structure to deal with these kinds of intentional delays. How do we have the right policy, the right environmental policy, so that we can realize the, edu the, the economic outcomes? How do we address the educational issues, right? And so it, it's really this comprehensive approach to the fact that we've got 22 centers thinking about how they all interact with each other that's, that's key to this. Um, so with that, let me open it up. Anybody else have ideas? I, 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 don't, okay. I don't know. So a couple things. Um, yes, there's a lot of money that's flowing into green energy project, projects. And so people who are invested in companies that are then going to go receive some of those funds may do better than they would have absent those funds. What's striking about it, that, though, is that if you look at where there's the greatest potential for improving environmental outcomes, it's actually at the firms that ESG won't invest in, yeah. right? Because if you look at the dominant, like, so what, what, these ES, what these mutual funds do is they rank companies on their environmental impact. And so you, uh, the ESG funds are like overexposed to technology, which did really poorly in 2022, and they're underexposed to, to oil and gas. Who is it that's going to improve the environmental impact of oil and gas extraction? Is it a technology company or is it an oil and gas company? And yet, so, we're, so there's academic literature out there that actually documents that by curtailing your investment in oil and gas companies, you're actually starving the very companies that would be the ones most likely to do the green innovation. Let me ask you, we got the wrap it up sign, yeah. but let me ask you, I, can I have the last <laughs> question? Absolutely. All right. So could we at AFPI on the ESG Center, could we take your slide that shows that the big polluters are China and whatever? Yeah. Uh, could we take that and basically start a big thing of, if you really care about ESG, you have to care about yeah. all things that reduce the economic output of China. No, I mean it's this is kind of yes. started. That, to that would be re the, that would be pivoting into I think a narrative that's rising, which is China doesn't have our best interest. It's in one of our best arguments against all the green energy stuff. It's like, well, we're not it, look. Even if the United States didn't even exist as a nation, even if we were vaporized would have no impact on carbon emissions, virtually, because it's all coming from these other countries. And Americans kind of get that. They realize that the bigger, their pollution levels in China are like four times higher than ours are. So unless you get, incidentally, not, I don't know if we have that chart about all the countries. I don't know if that was one. But you know, there are like 50 countries that signed the, um, clim, clim, 50 countries Kyoto. that matter, that, that signed the Paris Climate Accord. How, you know how many of those are in compliance with it? 
Zero. Zero. Like one or two. We're probably but, closer. Yeah. Yes. The country that's been re reduced its, its carbon emissions the most over the last 10 years has been the United States. Because you know, of natural gas. Natural gas. And they're against natural gas. Natural gas is one of the great, you know. Meanwhile, the I Germans mean, took their nuclear power plants offline and are now doing coal. Right. And, and, and the no. Germans, when I was no, the no, U.S. ambassador in Denmark, sense. the yeah. German ambassador was attacking me. You use fossil fuels. I'm like, yes, they're beneficial. And, and he, they were refusing to keep their energy uh, going. Their nuclear was coming offline. They were bringing in that Russian gas, which my team and I blocked the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline working with the White House. The only place it wasn't built was my area of responsibility. But remember that ESG is not just environment. It's social and governance. It's Marxism. So I have a question for you, Tim, because you're in the industry, and this is something I get asked a lot. If, if uh, Joe Biden is so against oil companies, why is the oil com are all the, well, the oil companies doing so well? So, you know, because their stocks have gone up. So how do you respond to that? Uh, because they went down so much. Okay. <laughs> 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 we all tanked during COVID, and it's just it's just now coming back. But isn't it something? Remember, we had a negative forty dollar a barrel day. I do. Yeah. Our stocks went way down, and they're just coming back to. They're just coming back well, up. Well, so let's say you continue to stop new drilling, then some, somebody like you is going to. Well, so there, right? as I said the earlier, these going. all these uh, uh, all these regulations and stuff really hadn't started hitting yet. Okay. So you you haven't really seen the effect. Uh, you're going to see, which is scary, right? Right. It is. You, you're going to see those effects out in the future. Yeah. yeah. And what it does is it no. it exports a lot of our wealth. You know what affects people's voting? What statistic really affects people's voting behavior? The gasoline price. No question about it. Well, and the regulations really hurt the small producers and put more of the power in the exactly. exactly. that, That's for that's sure. Right? So we, we got time maybe for one, one more. Yes. So <laughs> my company, we do most of the maintenance work for all the coal fire plants throughout the Midwest. Wow. Boilermakers, we're the largest employer of boilermakers. Most union. Agreed. Go approach those trade unions yeah. and say, what we just talked about is yeah. going to put you out of business. That's great. So one of the one of the pieces we've, we're working on at AFPI right now is looking at the reduction in employment among union workers from switching to electric vehicles, yeah. because as you may know, their manufacturing is much more automated and much less labor intensive. And it's not here. And it's not here. <laughs> And so we're, we're actually going state by state and estimating That's the right. reduction in employment that the Biden administration's mandatory shift to electric vehicles would, would, would entail. So a project, that, a project you'll want to support. By the back to, <laughs> my producer in the back has told me to cut off, so right. let me take Thank the opportunity. You all. Thank you all very Thank much. Everybody Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well done. Same here.